Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Camping Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. And now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. There are lots of situations where I went camping and it snowed or it was super cold or there were small accidents, but there's one that stands out to me that took a while to deal with and it was fairly recent. I was visiting my family and I decided to bring my gear to go camping with my dad and my youngest brother. We had never been with just the three of us as adults. My dad was in declining health at this point in time and was going to need a transplant soon. So we stayed close and went car camping nearby in the mountains. It was a beautiful spot, and it ended up being a super nice time. Very chill, good food, fun conversation around the fire. We woke up in the morning and started making coffee and breakfast, and my dad went to go use the restroom. He was pretty weak, and we watched him basically just collapse and fall forward, face first, down an embankment of boulders into a wash or gully or whatever you want to call it. We jumped up and ran to him. His nose looked broken. His face sliced. The top of his hand had degloved due to his thin skin. He was concussed, but mostly okay. I went into overdrive, grabbed a tarp from under a tent, and threw it over the seat of my brother's car. We washed off what dirt we could from my dad, and set up to take him down the mountain to the hospital, which wasn't terribly far away. I stayed behind to clean up camp and process aging family and life circumstances changing. And then it gets worse. The doctor was pretty skeptical of his injuries, tested his blood alcohol content, thinking that he might be drunk in spite of the fact that he had been going through treatment for liver disease. And he was right something like 0.2% at 7 a.m. My dad had been suffering from pretty bad depression from being so sick, so he had decided to just go the whole way. From what I understand, the drinking wasn't what triggered the disease, but definitely was exacerbated by it. It was rough, in ways that I still don't fully comprehend. The good news is that it was a big wake-up call, I think even for him, So he told a lot of people in his community, stopped drinking, ended up getting a transplant. We went winter camping last month now that he has been recovering, mostly to just have another experience that wasn't so traumatic. It was nice though. I will still say that one trip was one of my top five for the hardest days of my life. My parents and I got lost in Grand Gulch for two days. On the tail end of a five-day trip, we were exiting the canyon. The route seemed a lot more difficult than we anticipated. We knew there would be a faint trail, if any, but once we crested the rim, we found out that we were way off course. Knowing the general direction we needed ahead, we started walking and conserving water as much as we could, having left the multitude of water pockets in the canyon below us. We slept that night under a pinion pine and shared our last couple power bars, hoping to find some source of water the next day in the open desert. After a few miles, the next morning, we finally came upon a faint road that became more pronounced as we went on. This road brought some good feelings knowing we stashed a shuttle bike for someone to ride the last eight or so miles to the van. Finally, we got to the bike cache and my stepdad hopped on as a rainstorm started rolling in. After half an hour or so, it turned to a full downpour, which was great because we were really thirsty. After walking what felt like an eternity and wondering where our ride was, we walked upon the primitive, empty, other than our van, parking lot, 
we see my stepdad tearing through it trying to get it started. It had a dead battery. He ended up riding through thick mud another six miles to the highway to try and flag someone down. He ended up catching the eye of a ranger out patrolling. He got us a tow truck and took us in to Blanding, Utah, while we got that jerk of a van running again. That felt like a lot for 11-year-old me. My fiance and I were on a camping trip last summer in Arkansas, casually grilling some dinner when we heard someone loudly yelling for help. I ran a few campsites over to find a clearly drunk man standing in a pool of his own blood. Apparently he had dropped his knife and nicked an artery in his ankle, which was spurting blood like a fountain. My fiance was not far behind me and helped get it wrapped up and elevated while I ran back for my phone to call an ambulance only to find out that I had no cell service. I knew there was a hospital roughly 20 miles away, so I made a judgment call, and I loaded the man up into his truck and took off. Now is a good time to mention that blood makes me super squeamish, and I think pure adrenaline is the only thing that kept me from passing out at the wheel. I made it to the hospital in 12 minutes, just as he started slurring his speech and hinting at losing consciousness. I still remember the pool of blood spilling out of the door off the floor mat as they took him inside. My fiance picked me up from the hospital and we headed back. We ended up having to watch his dog and tried our best to have a normal evening. The man showed back up at around 10.30 p.m. with 18 stitches. The doctor had told him that if we hadn't been there or we had waited for an ambulance, he would have bled out and died. Horrifying situation but we saved a man's life. I went camping up at Rock Island, Wisconsin over the summer. For anyone who hasn't been there, you have to take a ferry off of Door County to Washington Island and then a second boat to Rock Island. It's totally primitive, remote, and has a lot of history. The island has three separate cemeteries and building remains from early, early settlers. It was a perfect clear night, so my husband and I wanted to go stargazing at a field about a quarter mile from our campsite. To get there, you had to pass by one of the cemeteries. Just as we did, maybe halfway to the field, a thick fog starts rolling in. We decide to keep going when I noticed a set of glowing eyes in the distance. I start freaking out, and I get my husband to shine his flashlight over in that direction. Suddenly, three to four more sets of eyes appear, just as the fog really starts to thicken. We immediately started sprinting back to camp after nearly crapping ourselves. Turns out, the whole island is home to a whole heck of a lot of foxes, who like to wander near the campsites at night, and they all decided to visit just as we were making our way out. I personally have two camping horror stories. Number one, my wife and I hiked and camped backcountry in Glacier National Park a few years ago. 12 miles in, no cell signal. Tent site locations were strictly set. You have to camp exactly where your permit says. Ours was next to two tall dead trees. Besides that, it's totally open landscape. Bushes, rocks, other sparse tall dead trees. At 4 a.m., a huge thunderstorm rolled in crazy wind, rain, and lightning. Nowhere to run and hide. Pitch black darkness besides bright flashes of light. I was scared to death for the entirety of the storm, anticipating the trees crashing down on our tent. But in the end, we did make it out. And then, my second story. 2012, 
Shenandoah National Park backcountry. I was camping solo in a hammock with a fly over top. The guidelines from the fly stretched out about 10 feet into the surrounding woods. Around midnight, I heard some rustling in the woods, and by dim moonlight, I saw two black bears appear. They approached my camp casually, rooting for food in the leaves and rocks. Eventually, they were at the 10-foot mark. I could hear them breathing. They flipped over several large rocks around the perimeter, looking for grubs or whatever. My biggest fear was that one of them would accidentally stumble into and become entangled in the thin guidelines of the fly, get angry and confused and flip out. I laid awake from midnight to 2 a.m. with a Fox 40 whistle in my mouth and a three-inch foldable pocket knife ready to defend my life. In the end, though, they just wandered off. Ultimately, I consider these both to be fantastic memories, although at the time, I experienced severe mental discomfort. I worried about bears for many years after the Shenandoah incident, but I eventually got over it, and now I sleep like a log whenever I camp, regardless of the surroundings or animal species present. Me, my wife, and our three kids in Franconia Notch, New Hampshire. We spent the week at a campground, visiting the basin and all kinds of cool spots. We were hiking the ridge trail, etc. On the second night, we got back late from hiking, ate, and cleaned the dishes. And we were putting everything in our car, and a big black bear shows up and gets close enough that I could have touched his nose. I banged a big metal spoon on a pot right in its face. I thought he would either run or kill me. Luckily, he ran, but came right back. I did it again and followed him with it. That is the second most scariest thing from the trip. Number one goes to the last night that we were there. It was 4th of July, hot and sunny all day. We watched fireworks in a nearby town and came back to camp. Around midnight, a storm came in so strong that rain was getting under the fly so I went out with my son to put a tarp over the tent. Large tree branches were coming off and rolling through the campground, and very tall trees were bending low to the ground. I watched people abandon their tents and drive off, and their tents just blew away into the trees. I had no choice but to wait it out, since I lived 14 hours away in Pennsylvania, and I didn't want to leave my stuff behind. By morning, telephone poles were down, and the place was a complete mess. I got no sleep all day, and all night I waited for certain death, then attempted to drive home 14 hours. I made it to a farm in Vermont and took a nap while everyone else visited the farm store. It's a great memory, but insanely scary at the same time. When I was about 13, I was camping with family, and as I was sleeping, I woke up in the middle of the night and was just staring at the fire. As I was staring at the fire, I saw a man, or at least a figure of a man, walk up to the fire, remove a burning log from the fire, put it on his shoulder, and walk away until he disappeared, and the fiery log with him. Till this day, I don't understand what happened. I was terrified but couldn't scream, and when we all woke up, I looked around the fire and saw some cans of gas and lighter fluid rather close by, and I can't help but to wonder if that figure was some kind of otherworldly entity who may have saved our lives by removing the log, because had the fire stayed the size it was, it would have caused a huge fire with the slightest change in the wind. A buddy and I were camping in backwoods Idaho mountains, pretty far from everyone in the middle of the week. Nearest town is like 600 people an hour away. 
We got camp set up around seven and we get a fire going to cook hot dogs. We're just chilling around the fire when it gets dark. We're just snacking on like Cheetos and stuff. As we talk, we heard branches up the mountain from us cracking. It sounded as if something was stepping on bushes and stuff. We stopped talking and the noises stopped as well. We were a little unnerved, but we brought guns to go shooting the next day and we've got a pretty big fire going. So we started talking again. The rustling gets closer, like something or someone is moving down the mountain. We stop talking and the noises stop again. This happens like two more times. We talk, something or someone moves closer. We stop, the noises stop. Finally, when whatever or whoever it was is like 200 feet away in the dark, I grabbed my rifle out of the truck and put a shot into the air. Whatever it was leaves up the mountainside in pitch black. We're talking like 400 feet in 30 seconds. I didn't think that it was an elk or bear or cattle. It was super eerie and it knew to stop when we stopped talking. But I don't think it could have been a person. It moved way too quickly up the hill in dense brush and pitch black. We've not gone back there ever since. This isn't exactly a camping story, but when I was 15, we lived on a five acre property outside of a small town, surrounded by woods that I regularly explored during the day. I got into a fight with my parents and ran out of the house, hiding behind a hill in the backyard until I saw them get into the vehicle and leave. I then entered the house, went to my room, grabbed a duffel bag that I was storing supplies in under my bed, added my pillow and blanket and left again, grabbing my bike. I then walked into the house through my usual path at the back of the property. I went to my usual place, an old house, well, the remnants of a basement to what was once a house. I set to work turning the large circle hole about five feet deep lined with bricks into my shelter. I didn't complete the roof, but figured I would get to that the next day. I didn't build a fire, I grab my blanket and pillow to lie down shortly after dark. Just as I'm about to fall asleep, I hear a twig snap and promptly set up. I calm myself down, assuring myself that animals step on branches and stuff too and I was just overreacting. Just as I'm about to drift off again, I hear someone ringing a bell. I sat up, threw my pillow and blanket in my bag and walked out of the woods, leaving my bike behind. This time, I went out towards the highway, which was a considerably faster way to exit the woods. Parked by the barrier was three cars, adding confirmation that humans were with me in the woods for an unknown reason. I walked quickly down the highway to our house and went inside to find that we had visitors. Technically, they were there because they were helping my parents look all over town for me. No one thought to check the woods. I put my bag down while I found out the details of the search and received my parents' lectures for scaring them. I was sent to bed and had to come back down to get my pillow and blanket. It was then that everyone paid attention to my bag. The main guy who had helped them even looked in and was surprised by how prepared I was to live in the woods. I had dishes, pans, a hatchet and shovel, along with spare clothes and some other random stuff that I don't recall. I never entered those woods after dark again, and I found out shortly after that the house that was burned down that I was staying at supposedly used to house a family of cannibals who had killed a bunch of people in the area, and they were burned alive when they were caught, and then their house was torn down. I never did admit that that was my special place in the woods. In college, I went camping and hunting with a girlfriend on an island where my family has a very tiny plot of unusable land. The island borders the ship channel in coastal Louisiana, about five miles from the Gulf. 
this place is relatively new, but I've scouted it before. We get to the spot, and I have to pull my boat across about 60 yards worth of four-inch water over a sandy bottom to get close to the shoreline. I then bury a big four-foot aluminum rod as far as I can get it into the sand with my bow rope on it. Boat's tied up. Girlfriend is excited. We bushwhacked our way through somewhat of a sandy clearing on a hill next to a small bluff where the boat is staked and tied below. First issue, no mosquito repellent, and they were awful. Whatever. We pick up and head into the thicket, being careful because there were signs of massive hogs out there. We find a spot, set up, and start hunting. Aside from the mosquitoes, we didn't see anything but a really pretty sunset. And that is when it all went to crap. I didn't have a flashlight. We ended up getting into some thick stuff on the way back, and pigs started darting around. We could hear them, but we couldn't see them. I only had the laser on my AR, which was absolutely useless for vision. She's freaking out. Pigs are crashing around. We pushed forward slowly and made it out and quickly walked back to camp to start a fire. We had to shoo some wild cows away from our spot, and one broke one of my tent poles, but whatever, it was still working. We started a fire and ate, and everything was a little bit better. So we turned in. I toss and turned. It was like 60 degrees, but the humidity and fog was so bad that it was dripping off the roof of the tent. Soaking wet, cold, we were just trying to make it through the night. I woke up to the sound of a hurricane, waves crashing ridiculously loud. I thought, what the heck? Then I thought about the boat. I ran down there with no light, only the laser on my AR and the dim light of the moon through the fog. A big LNG ship had come down the channel, and it pushes a wall of water that, when it gets to the shallows, curls up and crashes and drags trees. It's pretty violent. So I look around. No boat. I am in full panic now. I start shining the laser around, hoping to bounce off of something. It took about a minute, and I hit the shiny reflective boat registration tag. It was well into the ship channel. I ditched my pants and gun and started swimming, at night in the ship channel. I get to my boat tangled in trees from the bow rope and half sunk. I got it back finally, and it was about 5 a.m. Once there was enough light, I packed up the tent and we left. That was absolutely the worst night camping in my entire life. My husband, my older children, and I were camping in southern Colorado in the summer of 2020. This was a multi-state loop over close to two weeks, and our last sight out of four. Before dawn on our first night in the Durango area in a federal campground, we both woke up incompletely because someone was walking around outside our tent with a flashlight. We were both acutely aware that someone was outside our tent, but we both also perceived other things were happening and realized that it wasn't the time to bolt up and run outside with a gun. We discussed this later that morning, and we both were conscious, but perceived intuitively that we should not react to what was happening, so we did not. It was the local sheriff walking around within inches of our tent and shining a flashlight into our tent. The sheriff didn't address us, wake us up, or ask any questions. Late the night before, as we were going to sleep after pitching camp after dark, we heard loud screaming and arguing. My husband just assumed that it was a party of drunk people, and I remember him telling me to go to bed with the girls and not to worry. It was a violent domestic dispute in a campsite, several parcels over from us, and by the time it was pre-dawn, the sheriff had been called. The instigator, alleged, parked his truck 20 feet from our campsite in the middle of the night and fled. The armed sheriff had been looking for him when he walked around our tent and shined his flashlight into our tent. Had either my husband or I decided that we were in mortal danger, 
and rushed outside with a weapon, we would have had a bad situation. For our first anniversary, I took my husband on his first real camping trip. He's 13 years older than me, but his family had never been into it. And as an adult, he just did drinking trips with his friends. We originally went to the St. Croix State Park, which turned out to be like a KOA with trees and more mosquitoes. We got a shadow show when the people across the road from us decided to passionately hug in their dining tent with a lantern lit. The next day, we talked to a park ranger, and after explaining what we were looking for in a campsite, she recommended that we go to the forest instead, gave us a refund on our remaining nights, and directions to the camping area. It was exactly what we wanted, and about 25 miles into the forest, we got set up and made something to eat. Afterwards, my husband got to work making a cleaning stick. This involved swinging his knife at the end of the stick he was holding. My husband, being adamant about knife safety, this seemed odd to me. I asked him if this was dangerous, to which he said, a little. I asked if he was worried about getting hurt. He replied, not really, and promptly swung the knife into his left pointer finger. His knives are extremely sharp. I jumped up, grabbed the first aid kit, cleaned and butterflied the wound, and suggested going to the hospital, but he wouldn't hear of it because he hates hospitals. The nearest one was about 50 miles from the town. That was 25 miles from our campsite, and he didn't want to ruin the trip. He busted his wound care open a few times. After the fourth time, I told him that if it happened again, we were going to the hospital because the accumulated blood loss was getting to a level that I wasn't comfortable with. He said no, and explained that he just kept forgetting and bending his finger. I looked around the tent, grabbed an empty cigarette pack, he smoked back then, tore it apart, folded up a section, covered it from end to end with waterproof tape from the first aid kit, and taped it to his finger. Two days later, we go home just in time for him to get ready and go to work, as a security guard at Regent's Hospital. He takes all the wound care off in the car right before walking into work. During his shift, the head nurse of the hospital came into where he was doing a patient watch. He asked her if she minded taking a look at his finger, after already telling her that he went camping deep in the woods for his anniversary. She was amazed at how well it was taken care of, and asked him who did it, so he explained that I had, and told her the details. She told him that I would make a great ER nurse because of how well I kept my head, and said that if I ever wanted to go to school for it, she would sponsor me. I never pursued it, but it still makes me proud to know that I did that well. He has a small scar but never lost any ability to use that finger. I am a 25 year old female. At the time of this story, I was 16 or 17. My then boyfriend and two of our other friends decided to go camping in a small patch of woods next to a neighborhood that was being developed. And the small patch of woods was roughly 900 feet across both ways. On the left side, if you were viewing it from the road, was the underdeveloped neighborhood. No people living in the houses. They are mainly just wood and no windows, just actual walls. And on the right side was about a mile long driveway that led up to a house a little over a half mile past the patch of woods. Pretty deserted. So, we get to our tent, fire pit, chairs, etc. set up. And we're relaxing as it starts to get dark. When we hear extremely loud screaming coming from a woman, maybe 400 to 500 feet away. At first, there weren't any words that we could make out. But then there was a help and a no and then the loudest, most terrifying scream was cut off mid-scream. We can't see through these trees. They're thick, and it's getting dark. So we get out, leave all our stuff behind. As we're walking back to the underdeveloped neighborhood where we parked, keep in mind the screaming was coming from over that way of the woods, 
So we had to get out near the long driveway to the road around the tiny bit of woods into the underdeveloped neighborhood where we'd park. I'm immediately on the phone with police who are trying to tell me that it was just a cat in heat. From where we parked, we were facing the woods. A man comes out, dragging something in heavy sheets slash cloth slash something, spots us and starts coming towards our car. The police pulled in right then. The man ran and as it turned out, he had killed a woman about 400 feet from where we were camping. Don't know if he was ever caught, but please, let's not meet. To understand my story, you sort of have to know a tiny bit about trespassing laws in our country, in that we don't have any so long as you're respectful and not destructive. We can walk over any hills you like, and in my case, camp on any beach of your choosing, so long as once you leave the area, it's how you found it. I used to love camping when I was little. Our family would go multiple times a year with a large group of my parents' friends and their kids. On average, there were maybe 10 of us at a time which was a bit of a logistical challenge, since we always headed out to this one really remote beach on the coast. Actually, we weren't the only ones. There's always yachts just bobbing off the short pier with people in them and other campers lining up and down the beach. Most of them also had children and teenagers, so it wasn't a wild party scene. It was very much an informal family holiday spot. There was even a small building with toilets and showers installed nearby, even though this was the middle of nowhere. I guess the local council must have figured it out and got sick of people peeing behind bushes. We took a trip up in spring 2011. I'm really bad with time, but I know this because I got my dog in winter of 2010. After picking her out that November from the shelter as a birthday gift from me to me, as I paid her adoption fee. Reddit, I know you love dogs, and she will be very important to the story later on. So let me tell you a bit about Parmesan. Parmesan came to me as a six-month-old puppy who had been rescued from a dogfighting situation. We're not entirely sure what breed she is exactly, but my best guess is a lurcher staffy mix. She's a wonderfully well-tempered dog with people, and most dogs, but you absolutely do not threaten her. She'll have you. So, by the time of this camping trip, I'd had Parmesan for a few months. She'd never come camping with us before, but far as my family are concerned, dogs go on camping trips. So, we all piled into the car and she came too. Unusually though, none of my family friends could make it, so it was only me, my sister, my dad, and my mom. I didn't mind. I wasn't that attached to the other kids. I'd rather play with my dog and I'd still have my sister. The drive took the best part of six hours, and because we'd left a bit later, Although, I don't remember why we'd left later than normal. We arrived at sunset. Not a good time to be building a tent, but we'd expected to arrive to other campers already set up on the beach illuminated in campfires. The beach was empty. In spite of this, my parents started taking stuff out and trying to build the tent. They asked us to fetch some of the lighter bags from the boot of the car while they sat pointing a flashlight at the sand to see properly. I rolled down the window of the car for Parmesan before getting out. It was pretty hot for that time of year, and I wanted her to have some air. Always got to be looking out for my furry little homie. As we're fumbling about in the dark on a beach, in the middle of nowhere, it's pretty spooky. The one road that led to this beach was circular and had a bridge over the water, meaning you could basically circle around the beach like a big zero shape if you felt like it. I wasn't really paying attention to the road. I was more complaining that I was tired, as kids do. After maybe 15 minutes of my dad trying to nail the tent into the sand, my mom's asking him, had he seen that car drive around? It's been a few times. My dad kind of shrugged her off. He's sort of like that. I don't know if he said anything back to her, but after a few more minutes, a car pulled up next to ours on the road and someone got out. It was maybe 15 or 20 feet from the cars to where we were, and the light was pretty low, except for the torches. We weren't expecting to see anyone else out here at this point. And I think my mom said, it must be the security. I don't know why a random beach would have security. I think what she meant was the wildlife trust or something, as they do occasionally come down to do their nosy. 
the guy was walking pretty unevenly. He must have been drunk or high because he had that stagger to him. There was absolutely no way this guy was sober. Cool. A junkie. Not an unusual find, but it's rare to see them in the wild. As he walked into the flashlight range, we realized he was carrying a large knife. Probably about 15 inches. Although I was small at the time, so maybe my sense of scale was off. I don't like my dad, but credit to him, because once he saw this man, he got up immediately, holding onto the camping mallet and put us all behind him. The man began to shout wildly at us that we can't camp here and he was just letting us know. My dad tried to initially be a bit low-key with the guy and told him that this was fine. We'd leave, but this didn't work. He kept coming closer to us, so my dad started shouting and the man kept shouting back. My sister and I were crying. I remember shaking. I was utterly terrified as I'm sure anyone would be in that situation. It really did seem like this guy and my dad were going to fight, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't fancy my dad's chances. While it's grim to consider, I'm absolutely convinced he would have killed my dad and possibly us as well once he was done, as I don't think my mother would have had the common sense to run with us. I love her, but she's always put dad and her relationship with him above us. This isn't how it went down. A bolt from the black like a wolf descending upon its prey took us all by surprise. Most of all, the man with the knife. In that moment, Parmesan was the apex predator, large canines represent in nature. She got him good by the arm and clamped down hard, ripping his jacket and shredding the skin underneath. He dropped the knife, as it had been in the arm that she had got him by. He kicked her. He punched her and eventually got her off. He grabbed the knife from the sand and ran back to his car and drove off. Parmesan didn't follow him. She stayed with us muzzle covered in blood quickly as we gathered our things and all got back in the car all pretty shook up by the incident i looked parmy over she was okay but the car's window was much more open than i'd left it we think what happened was when the shouting started she must have put her paws up on the gap i'd left for her as it was an old car and had the rolly down windows and not an electric button we think she must have been able to hit it with her paws to force it down enough to squeeze out this is not the end of my story. We're all pretty scared, and since we had the dog with us, we couldn't book it into a hotel for a night. My parents decided just to drive us home, so we could all feel safe, but first had to drive into the nearest town for gas, as they were kind of low. I spent the time trying to clean Parmesan up a little. I'd always loved dogs, but what she'd just done for me blew my mind. As we drove into town, we came across the petrol station, but it looked closed. My dad drove up closer to get a better look and stuck his head out the window to get a better look at the sign. My mom asked him what on earth he was doing and he told her he was trying to see when it opens. Never. My heart sank. Parked in the corner behind a van so we hadn't seen him at first was the man with the knife. He was sitting in the boot of his car using some tissue paper to clean up his arm. It looked pretty bad. Without stopping to refuel or look anywhere else in town, my dad drove right out of there. He decided to go to the next town over, but this was removed. The next town over was 60 miles away. He didn't have that much gas. We realized, as we began driving, we were going to break down. That's fine, Dad said. We had AAA coverage. They'd come tow us home, or at least to somewhere acceptable for the night. It's better than staying in the last town. After driving for maybe five minutes, lights flashes from behind. Another car. The same car the man had been driving. It was him, following us. He must have realized we were low on gas. The next half hour was one of the worst half hours of my life. I had a complete and utter breakdown, as did everyone really. I could tell my parents were trying to keep it under wraps, so it wouldn't upset us, but we weren't really little kids. We were both double digits. We knew how dangerous this situation was. Dad turned off the radio to conserve petrol, and the man followed us for about 55 miles before he peeled away onto another road. Our fuel meter was on the big red E for empty for the last 10 miles we were driving on fumes. I didn't really believe in God, but if he does exist, that was definitely one of his miracles. Once we got there, he drove into a petrol station and refilled to a full tank before driving the rest of the way home. 
sister and I slept in the car after that. I only woke up once we made it all the way home, just grateful nothing worse had happened than that. After getting some sleep, my mom phoned the non-emergency line for the police and reported what had happened. They never got back to her after that, but apparently the woman she spoke to said they may wish to in the future, as he matched the description given of a suspect wanted in relation to a murder charge. No idea if he was actually the guy or just a random psycho. As I said, they never got back to her. So what's the takeaway then? Other than crazy man on the beach, let's not meet. Well, for me, it's that I love Parmesan. She's still with us now. Old as the hills and twice as grizzled as one of my mom's friends likes to joke. I don't know why she did what she did that day. I couldn't tell you what her thought process was. What I do know is that this poor puppy was born into an environment where they abused and neglected her, only to be rescued and taken to a shelter where her mother and siblings all found homes for her. Despite how badly people treated her, when I took her home, she forgave but never forgot. I think the saying is, I never trust a person who doesn't like a dog, but I always trust a dog when they don't like a person. They have a very good understanding of human body language, and I think she must have understood how much danger we were in. If you're able to, please adopt. You might find yourself in a good situation like mine one day. I promise you, if you're willing to save a four-legged friend's life, they'll pay you back tenfold if they're able to, without a thought for their own safety. I paid 78 euro for Parmesan's adoption fee, which is a lot when you're a kid, but it chills me to my bones knowing that if I hadn't been so insistent on my dog, I might be dead. I was out walking around the bush hunting for upland birds. I walked through a bit of a valley as a shortcut to get to another area. When I came across a guy standing on the trail with an AR-15 at the ready position. Instantly the hairs on the back of my neck stood up instinctively knowing that this wasn't a place that I wanted to be. Trying my best to stay calm I said, Hey, just out bird hunting. How are you doing? He replied, fine. Then there was a long pause. I'm hunting for deer. Deer season wasn't open. AR-15s are not legal for deer, and he wasn't dressed for deer hunting. As a matter of fact, he looked homeless. Hadn't changed his clothes or bathed or shaved in several days, obviously. And he looked emaciated. Think of the scariest 50-year-old meth addict you can think of and put an AR-15 in his hands and you're probably pretty close. Do you know the best way for me to go to find some birds? Well, I imagine you might find some back the way you came. His voice got noticeably sharper with the back the way you came, and I obviously took the hint. I don't know if there was a meth lab or what just down the trail, but I was certainly happy to leave. I reported the incident to the sheriff the next day, but I don't know if anything ever came of it. I went on a group camping trip in the middle of nowhere, Arizona, only to awake and hear something sniffing the outside of our tent. My immediate reaction was that it was likely a bear or some animal that came across our site, and maybe just my idiot friends didn't tie up the garbage. Seconds later, I can hear the sniffing go to the next tent, and everyone in mine grabs one another quietly to acknowledge that we were all awake and were aware of what's happening outside. Moments later, a friend in another tent popped out and started to scream and make noise. He had a gun too, hoping that it would scare off whatever animal was in our sight. Turns out, it wasn't an animal. It was some guy who had gone through our coolers slash food and also decided that it would be okay to sniff our tents. Our friend chased him off and we immediately packed our stuff and left. A year later, my idiot friends and I went back to the nearby area thinking that what we encountered was a one-time incident. This time, we thought we'd outsmart any possible creepers, and instead of camping in our tents, we all slept in the beds of our trucks and SUVs. 
because, you know, they can't possibly sniff a Toyota Tacoma. Anyways, it's the middle of the night. I'm passed out in the back of my SUV when I suddenly feel a bright light on my face. Naturally, I would have woken up, cussed, and asked who was doing that. However, I instantly knew to pretend to be asleep and not let the individual know that I was awake. I laid there next to my girlfriend, hoping that she would do the same as I, and I kept an ear out for any unusual sounds, like sniffing. All I could hear was a friend snoring by the campfire. After the light left my car, I heard the person walk to the next truck and shine his light on my friends in there. I slowly looked up, and it ended up being some older guy, just standing there staring at everyone while they slept. I waited until he left the campsite. Then I busted out of the truck, and I woke up my friends, most of which had also been pretending to sleep, and realized what was going on. This is my parents' story, not mine. They were on a canoe trip way up in somewhere Saskatchewan, far from any semblance of civilization. One morning, they hear a rustling sound outside their tent. Still half asleep, my dad sets up and tries to figure out what's going on. The noise is loud and very close. Before he can collect himself enough to go investigate, his whole side of the tent collapses in on top of him. The weight lifted quickly. Now entirely awake, my parents scrambled to open the tent flap and figure out what the heck was going on. About 10 feet away was a spooked black bear, staring confused and concerned at the tent. After being yelled at for a bit, it ran off. We figure it had been foraging in the bushes right behind the tent and lost its balance. So my dad can truthfully say that he has been sat on by a bear. I was camping in a valley by myself with no cell service. I stayed late on a trail and ran into a nice local dude as it was getting dark. He showed me a local camping spot close to the road and the river, but camouflaged. I had a fire, drank beer, and listened to my friend's comedy podcast. I was loud and visible. Because it was dark already, I decided to sleep in the back of my truck under my topper next to all of my gear as opposed to setting up my tent. The next morning I made a fire, cracked a beer and started making breakfast. Then I noticed that there's a man at the edge of my camp. He comes closer but never looks directly at me. This dude looks homeless, has a long ratty beard and has at least a hundred plastic grocery bags tied all over his clothes. I comment about how nice the day is. No response. I offer him breakfast. Nothing. He sort of paces around the perimeter of my camp. I offer him a beer, but he just turns around. The dude is just standing there, back to me, wandering around. I'm realizing that there isn't going to be any good happenings. I have my bear spray and buck knife super close. I give him an ultimatum. Hey, you're either going to acknowledge me or leave immediately. He ignores me. I grab the bear mace and walk a few steps toward him. He sulked away and I threw my stuff in my truck, and I left that place right quick. I wonder if he had watched me during the night, and I thank my laziness for staying in my truck instead of setting up the tent. My family has a camping timeshare, and we used to go camping for weeks at a time in the summer. My dad had to work, so he would stay at home Monday through Thursday and come meet us at the camping grounds Friday through Sunday. The campgrounds had a pool, miniature golf course, basketball courts, and we'd gone for so long that my mom was comfortable letting us wander, since there was only one entrance and exit. When I was around eight, but small for my age, so I looked around five, 
I met a little boy who was camping with his single dad for a few days. He came to our campsite a lot and knew we were staying for a while. I was pretty sad when he left, but his dad said they'd come back sometime soon. A few weeks later, his dad came to the campsite right after my mom left to take a shower. He told me his son was coming later that week. He asked where my parents were, and I told him my dad doesn't come until Friday, and my mom always takes a shower at this time. He said bye and left. The next day, he came by at the same time and told me that he had just found some kittens and asked if I wanted one. I said yes. He told me he kept them in his tent and I could come pick one up. Now, this guy wasn't a stranger. My mom had met him when he picked up his son from our campsite. So I didn't get that creepy stranger vibe and get okay going with him. We walked towards his campsite. Then he told me that he had actually moved them to his truck so they wouldn't get too hot, which made sense to me. He pointed to his truck right outside the gates of the entrance. I started walking towards the entrance with the guy when my dad pulls up. He got the day off work so he could spend more time with us. He asks what's going on and I say, Tommy's dad said he had kittens in the truck and they can have one. My dad gets out of the car, tells me to run back to the campsite so I do. When my dad gets back, he tells me to never go alone with an adult anywhere, even if I know them. I ask my mom years later about the whole thing and she told me that my dad kicked the crap out of him and called the cops. Let me start off by saying this is my first post on this subreddit, so if I missed anything up, please tell me and I'll fix it. Also, for reference, I was a 19-year-old female at the time, Still female, of course, just a little older. I love camping. Anytime my friends and I came home from college, we would load up our cooler with the beer, grab some gear, and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends ever wanted to go with me, so I would often suffer withdrawals from camping. One day, the weather was way too nice to waste, so I grabbed some of my gear, hopped in a car that I borrowed from a buddy, and drove to a spot that was secluded, yet within a safe distance to civilization that I could run and get help. Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but that creepy feeling is also somewhat of a plus for me. It's the same reason that people read these stories. It's fun to be scared. So, I make a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't brought all that much to eat, but I was enjoying myself. Reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I got the feeling I was being watched, and I stop dead in my tracks. I hear a twig crunch over to my right. Then I see a doe bolt from a hundred feet or so in front of me. I laughed at myself and went back to camp with the arm full of wood that I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside the ring of light cast by the fire. I always get inside my own head, so I shrugged it off and kept whittling at the stick that I had been messing with. Around one, I decided to go into my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beers in the most unladylike fashion and smoking cheap cigars. Another reason I like camping. I can act however I want. So I passed out relatively quick. At about 2 a.m., I start hearing footsteps. They sound pretty light and sort of timid. I think to myself that it's just a deer or some other animal, more likely a raccoon because I had probably left some food out. I'm still on guard though. About 30 minutes of sleeping with one eye open, I hear a rubbing noise, and the tent fabric is being pushed in a bit. I don't know how I didn't crap my sleeping bag, but I just sat there paralyzed with my K-bar in my hand. I desperately wanted to thrust the knife through the tent fabric, but I was still holding out hope that it was just some of my buddies from a frat joking with me. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, it all stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure, because daylight would be coming in about two or three hours, but I sure as shit wasn't going to sleep. All of a sudden, at about four o'clock, I realized I should put my boots on so that if anything did happen, I would be ready. After having stayed up and keeping alert a little while longer, my friend's car alarm goes blaring. I freak out and run out of the tent. I go about two steps before something grabs me around the mouth. I open my mouth to scream, but instead the person's pinky finger slips between my teeth. I've heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have huge adrenaline rushes. In my case, 
I just clamp down. And there's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous. His finger popped off. He screamed, pulled his hand away with the missing digit falling to the ground. He took off running down the hill that I was camping on. I took off right quick in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to the people whose house I ran to. A little sorority girl in a white beater, boxers, and steel toe boots. I also had some blood that had oozed out of my lip, not from the finger, but because I had also managed to take a pretty good chunk out of my lip as well. I told them what had happened. They called the police and got me some real clothing, and the man at the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there, they checked it out. The cops went to check it out, and when they came back, it was light out. They brought me back so I could get my friend's car. What I saw inside just made me more scared. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire earlier. The finger was also gone, suggesting that he had come back. The kicker is that they never caught the guy. So somewhere out there, a man is sitting down to dinner. Maybe alone. Maybe with a wife and a couple of kids. And he's missing his right pinky. So this one might be a bit long, but I need to go into it slowly, so bear with me. Me and my boyfriend love to camp. About two weeks ago, we decided to go to the coast because we had a Friday off from our classes in university and decided to hike and camp out for the weekend. We had a three-day plan to stay in three different towns and hike to each place. This story is about the first place we stayed in. The first town was barely a town. It was more like a bunch of small houses and farmlands and very few people. It was off-season, so normally there would be some tourists there, since the main attraction is a huge abandoned city left over from the times of the ancient Greek civilization. Anyway, since there were five to six camping grounds available, one of which was highly recommended on TripAdvisor and the likes of, we didn't bother calling beforehand. We simply headed there, and then straight to that camping area. Upon reaching it, we saw the gate open. Not really so unusual, but when we entered it, no one seemed to be there. We knocked and called out for someone, and no one responded, except the outdoor bar was all open with expensive bottles of alcohol lined up, and food left on the kitchen table, as we saw from the window. So, they couldn't have gone far. My boyfriend found it a bit strange they would leave everything open like that. But assuming it was a small community with no crime, we didn't think more. We went to some other campgrounds to ask if they were open. The first one we went to said they were closed because their grounds were very messy these days, but they did recommend us another place. We asked them about the first ground we had went to, and strangely, the man said don't go there. When we asked why, he said, I just don't. I don't really recommend you going there. Anyway, the other place he told us about was also closed, and luckily in the meantime I found a signboard for the first place, and it had their number on it. We called them, and a man picked up and told us that he and his wife, who ran the place, were out for a couple of hours, but they'd be back by the evening. He said we could set up our camp and that we would meet later. The place was a bit secluded, but it was quite picturesque, and we set our camp and left. We spent the whole day exploring and hiking around, and after a tiring day, around 10 p.m. after dinner, started to head back. This is where things got extra creepy. When we got back, we found the place still empty. No one had returned, and it was quite late. My boyfriend called up the owners again, and they said that they had decided not to return tonight, that we could leave the money under a table by the bar. They said the kitchen and bathrooms are open if we need to use them. The place was dark and the yard where we had set up camp was huge and without lighting. My boyfriend immediately started to feel a bit uneasy. He was concerned why two business owners would leave their property completely open to two total strangers, with a bar full of unopened bottles and half-open house. As we walked towards our camp, he kept subtly expressing his uneasiness and kept looking around. He's usually pretty calm, so I told him if he's really feeling so strongly about this, we can just go to the pension where we had dinner earlier and stayed the night there in a hotel room. 
He opened the flashlight of his phone and kept looking around and getting more and more uneasy. We agreed to pack up our camp and leave. I began to pack it up since it requires a lot of folding and he was extra anxious. I told him to just stand and give me light as I pack it up. Except constantly he would move the light and check the area. And I kept getting irritated because I could sense his worry. And at the same time I couldn't pack fast enough because I couldn't see. At one point he even told me in a slightly bitchy way to hurry it up. And as soon as I folded the camp, we stuffed it into its bag and hurriedly packed our stuff and scooted. He still seemed super anxious and I told him to relax. Just telling this part gives me the chills all over again. The road back to the main area of the town was dark and lonely. And this is when he told me. There's something I wanted to say, but not while we were still on the grounds. Well, what is it? I asked. He hesitated, then said he didn't want to freak me out, but he was sure that he saw someone lurking in the dark behind the wooden cabins and the bathrooms twice. No one was supposed to be there except for us. I got chills, but I still tried to rationalize saying it's a farm area, so there's lots of animals. Maybe a cat moving around. But he was adamant that it was a human figure walking like a human would and standing. That is why he kept checking and wanted to hurry so much. And that's why he was telling me to hush up and keep my voice down. I almost had tears in my eyes at this point, and the hair on my neck was standing. I kept looking back, and almost running at this point to the lighted area of the quiet town, and only really relaxed till we reached the pension, and booked a room there, got the key, locked, and checked it twice. I'm generally a skeptical person, but I really do believe that my boyfriend didn't just see things. I don't know who was back there or what could have happened, if anything, and I don't care to know. Dark and isolated places have always creeped me out anyways. Back in 2011, I was within a circle of friends that made it a tradition to go camping at a certain spot every May long weekend. The spot we chose was in a beautiful area right on the edge of a large lake, and was located on government land. The lake itself had a dam on it, so during May long, the water levels were always low, if not completely empty, making it possible to walk across it. People were allowed to camp there as long as they weren't causing any trouble or making a mess, and it was generally a good time for everyone. The spots themselves were spaced far enough apart that you had your own privacy, but not far enough that you couldn't meet other people. In this particular year, our spot was in the middle of a small hill, with one campsite below us and one above us. The first night of our trip happened without incident. During the second day, the people staying at the site below us had moved in. We didn't think much of it and continued drinking throughout the day and into the night. And around midnight, the people at the campsite below us were really out of control. They were yelling and screaming and their music had gotten even louder. So our friend Ben went down to ask them to turn their music down. He was promptly punched in the face, and he came back to inform us that he was 90% sure that they were on drugs. After that, the vibe wasn't as relaxed and we were all somewhat on edge. I was feeling really tired, so I just decided to go to bed. Some of my friends were still awake, including Ben, and one couple, Lily and Derek, that were visiting another campsite we had made friends with that day. I could hear the campsite below us was still blasting their music and partying pretty hard, but I just tried to ignore it and get some sleep. I don't know what time it was when I was jolted awake. Parts of this are somewhat a blur. All I know is that I sat straight up as soon as I heard the screaming and yelling coming from outside my tent. I quickly ran outside to find our campsite in total chaos. One of my friends was clutching their chest. People were running around and screaming to call 911. I was quickly informed of what happened. Apparently, not long after Derek had went to bed, the people camping at the site below us decided they weren't finished talking to Ben. And on their way up, they had encountered Lily and Derek walking back. Now, Derek and Ben are about the same height and have the same hair color. So they assumed that Derek was Ben and bottled both him and Lily over the head with a full glass bottle. I don't know if it was the same guys that showed up at our campsite, but 
but I was told that everyone else was sitting around the fire when two or three huge guys appeared from the darkness and walked over to them. One had a paring knife, and the other had a butcher's knife in their hand. Ben saw the knives and had gotten up to talk to them, and had barely spoken a word when the guy with the paring knife stabbed him once in the chest. At the time, some people from the campsite above had seen the guys coming and came down to help. One of the guys, Tim, was coming from down the hill when the guy with the butcher's knife ran up to him and stabbed him in the stomach. From there, sheer panic ensued. People called 911, but the ambulance was over a half an hour away. This is where I came out of the tent. Tim's wound was bleeding profusely, and he was losing blood way too quickly. His friends ended up putting him in the back of his car and speeding off to meet the ambulance halfway. Ben was also bleeding, but his wound wasn't as deep as Tim's, and we were able to keep him calm until an ambulance arrived. The guys with the knives ran off into darkness, back down to their campsite, and took off in their Land Rover. My boyfriend at the time and I had gotten into his car and drove to the entrance to try and flag down the policemen on their way to the scene. Once they arrived, we were informed to stay in the car, as they had released a canine search unit to hunt down the people who stabbed our friends. By the end of the night, they had arrested the men. They had tried to flee by driving their vehicle across the bed lake, where they got stuck in a muddy section. They were on a concoction of several drugs, as suspected. Luckily, both Tim and Ben survived. Although Tim had lost a lot of blood and took a few weeks to recover from his wounds, Derek and Lily have huge goose eggs, and possibly one person had a concussion, but I can't recall. One thing I do know, though, is that this was definitely the scariest thing I have ever experienced. This happened to my husband and I about three years ago, late November. It still gives us chills to this day. While living in Seattle, my husband and I would frequently go surfing. Usually we'd drive out to Mia Bay or Westport, but on this particular weekend, the surf report looked pretty messy for spots located directly on the coast. We decided instead to try hitting some spots along the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The land along the Strait is beautiful but remote. You can only access it by driving all along Highway 112, which runs from Port Angeles to Mia Bay. There's no cell service along most of the all of Highway 112, and only a smattering of small towns. So, we decide to try surfing along the strait at this one spot, Twin. We'd surfed there before and had a good lay of the land. The report showed that the waves would be the best in the early morning. So we opted to drive out the evening before and sleep in our car overnight. Since it was late November, we decided to forego paying for a camping spot at a nearby campground and would just park somewhere along the beach at Twin. We figured there would be no one there and we were right. We arrived around 3.30 p.m. and the only other people parked were a young couple in their Westphalia. Nothing terribly eventful occurred between our arrival and 7 p.m. We arrived cooked some dinner, and I took a quick walk along the beach. The only other thing that occurred was just before sunset we heard this loud whistling, and then saw some guy who'd been walking along the highway come down the entrance road towards the beach. My husband and I thought it was pretty odd, given that there's absolutely nowhere you can easily walk to along that highway. All he had with him was a tiny backpack, so he definitely wasn't hiking. He said hello to the young couple as he walked along the beach, and they invited him to hang out by their campfire for a while. Last time we saw any of them that night was when my husband and I decided to call it a night and go to sleep. This was about 7 p.m. I woke up about an hour later and opened the car door a bit to get some fresh air. I noticed that the young couple's Westphalia was gone, and something about them being gone unnerved me. I couldn't put a logical finger on why, so I chalked up my feelings to just being tired and I laid back down. When I woke up next, it was close to 11 p.m. And this time I shot up so quickly that my husband woke up. He asked what was wrong and I said nothing, just that I woke up startled. He seemed completely relaxed and fell back asleep. 
but I stayed up for about 15 minutes trying to listen for anything. In hindsight, I think my intuition was screaming to me that something was off. Since I didn't hear anything, I laid back down and really tried to focus on getting some sleep. About 20 minutes later, I woke up again, and this time to my husband already being up. He was sitting silently, listening. Him sitting so still freaked me out, so I turned on the interior car lights and asked him what was up. He whispered, someone was tapping on the windows. I remember feeling this deep sense of dread. When I woke up a few hours, I noticed that the couple in the Westphalia left. There's no one else camping here. At that, we both put our shoes on, grabbed flashlights, a knife, and pepper spray, and then opened the doors. Total silence. Pitch black darkness. My husband stared up towards the trees behind us to look around, while I stood by our car and shined a light down onto the beach. I saw no one and sat on the back bumper while he continued to look. I checked to see if I had cell service. Nope. Nothing. Maybe two minutes later, he returned walking fast. We need to leave. There's a car parked up by the exit road. It's just sitting there with the lights off and the ignition on. I couldn't tell if there was anyone inside. In no more than 60 seconds, we threw everything in the front seats into the back where we'd been sleeping, started the car, and started driving back up towards the entrance road. We didn't want a chance taking the exit road and driving by that car. We peeled out of there so fast that in a moment of disorientation, my husband turned the wrong way and started driving down the highway towards Nia Bay. As we started going the wrong way, we drove past the exit road, and lo and behold, there was the car, now with its lights on. A few seconds later, we both noticed that the car was speeding up behind us. I practically screamed, What are you doing? There's basically nowhere to turn around. The highway is narrow, with forest on one side and ocean on the other. Luckily, we saw a small turnaround coming up. I remember my husband just saying, Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, and then cutting hard to the left. As soon as we cut left, the person following us just kept going in the same direction. We took off down the highway going like 90 back towards Port Angeles. No one followed us the rest of the way back. I feel deeply creeped out when thinking about the intentions of whoever was in that car. I was camping in northeastern Ohio by myself. I was on my third and final night there. I woke up to use the restroom, and I walked about 10 feet from my hammock, and I noticed a headlamp about 80 to 100 feet in front of me. I watched it for about 10 minutes. I watched him stand up, sit down. I got my boots on and grabbed my hatchet, and I started walking to the right of my campsite. I was going to find out what he was up to. I got about 50 yards from my sight and started walking towards him when I noticed another headlamp about 40 feet from me and walking around. I hit the ground and threw some leaves on top of me. He walked about 10 feet from where I was lying. Then he stopped, lit a cigarette and finished his beer. He threw his can on the ground. After he got far enough that he couldn't hear me, I got up and started walking towards the first guy. I got close enough to him that I could hear his phone receiving messages. I stood up closer to him quietly to where I could see his face lit up from his cell phone. That's when he stood up and started walking towards my hammock. I laid there on the ground for a minute and made my way towards my sight. I stopped when I started hearing my tarp that I had above my hammock being trashed. Then I could see flashlights and then my big flashlight turn on and off. I heard my mess kit being thrown and them talking about how he was just here. I laid on the ground and watched my flashlight walk away until it was a small dim light. When the sun came up and I returned, my whole sight was destroyed. My hammock and tarp was shredded by what looked like a machete. My mess kit was stomped on. They took my backpack, rain gear, and flashlight. I went to the spot where I had first seen the guy 
and I found two pouches, eight empty beer cans, and an empty lighter. I walked to where I seen the other guy and found an empty bag of powder which turned up to be meth and a whole mess of cigarette butts. When I was younger, around 14 or 15 years old, my family used to camp at a state park. Every night, my friend and I would walk through the woods. We called this the ritual. This particular night, we decided to walk further into the woods than usual. We had flashlights, and we liked to try and navigate through the woods with them turned off. We were about half a mile from the nearest campsite when we heard soft whispering behind us. Obviously, we hit the flashlights and spun around. We didn't see anything, so we kept walking and we hear it again. This time, we stop and look around a bit before we decided to head back to our campsite. Then we see what's whispering. It's a lady crawling on the ground whispering random words. She was wearing dark clothes and was covered in dirt. When she sees that we notice her, she stands up and declares that she's looking for her campsite. We ended up walking her back to the campground and tried helping her find her group. Turns out she was just super drunk slash high and got lost trying to find a bathroom. Her friends didn't even notice that she was missing and if we didn't go that far into the woods, she would have been lost all night. It was really creepy. This event happened to me last summer. It was probably the scariest story in my life, and I wanted to share it so hopefully someone learns from it. Something I've realized growing up, year by year, is that this world can be an amazing place, but it is filled with some super sick people, and unfortunately, I've seen that side of our world firsthand. I'm a very social person, and love the opportunity to hang out with friends whenever I can. I'm also the type of person who's always looking for the next big thing. I guess I should tell you that I was a 17-year-old male at the time of this story, and I have a decent-sized friend group from both boys and girls. Throughout high school, we had done a lot of crazy stuff together. Being just out of high school, we wanted to do something insane together before departing for college, and we all decided to go camping in the middle of nowhere for three days. Fun, right? And for some miracle... All our parents thought it'd be fine. So we had six people going. Me and my girlfriend Stephanie, my friend Brandon and his girlfriend Kaylee, and Steve and his girlfriend Sarah. We had decided to have three different tents for each couple, for reasons that you could probably guess. Being a former Boy Scout, I was aware of everything that we needed to survive for three days. Food, water, and other essential supplies. Being rebellious teenagers, we also stocked up on plenty of booze and weed for our fun getaway. So mid-July, we depart for our camping vacation. After hours of driving and driving down back roads, we eventually find a place that looks secluded but not too sketchy like some horror stories. There were houses nearby, but not too close. Again, we weren't looking for a sketchy woods to camp, but unfortunately there was no service. It took us at least an hour to get everything set up. While the girls and Steve finished setting up camp, Brandon and I took a look around while fetching firewood. We eventually came across a cool looking trail. We weren't too concerned because there were houses within a mile radius, and we assumed that those people had used this trail to hunt, which was big in this area, or maybe animals used it. If you're wondering about our car, we drove a Honda Pilot, which was Steve's, that has plenty of room for us and our supplies. We parked the car rather close to the site, so we had eyes on the car at all times. The first night, nothing much happened. We rolled a blunt and drank a bit and called it a night. The next day, we decided to explore the woods a bit, but Brandon and Kaylee stayed behind to watch the site and spend time together. We decided to go down the path we found earlier. Around 20 minutes down the path, Steve spots a metal fence. We approach it to find a cemetery. 
The cemetery looked old, but there were signs of activity there. And no, not some voodoo stuff or cult. Like flowers and notes left. And beyond the cemetery, we saw a bigger trail that had tire tracks and a half-assed parking lot for the cemetery. We venture down the path a little bit more to spot some deer, then head back because it's getting late. That night, we really partied hard because we were to leave the next day and didn't want to return with extra beer or weed. Now this night was the polar opposite of the other night. The other night was peaceful, and we assumed the same about this night as we began to turn in. Boy, were we wrong. Now, you would assume there would have been warning signs earlier in our trip like a rusty knife on the path or foot tracks around our sight. No, not at all. All of us woke up to a blood-curdling scream coming from Steve and Sarah's tent as we hear the fabric being ripped by what we assume to be something sharp. I guess Steve hit the guy really hard with his flashlight and was able to get both him and Sarah to his car. Now here's the issue. Steve's tent is closest to the car while the other two tents are closer to the trail. So to get to Steve's car, we had to get past whatever attacked Steve and Sarah. Luckily, all our drunken selves were gone, because before getting into his car, he yelled cemetery and it clicked in my head. The trail on the other side of the cemetery. So I quickly grab Brandon, Kaylee, and Stephanie and start running towards the trail. I use my phone flashlight to help see. You might think, why would you turn your flashlight on? Well, last thing I wanted to do was miss the cemetery and be lost in the woods with the guy who attacked Steve. By the time we get to the trail, Steve and Sarah had gotten out from the site, and we could hear the guy chasing us, but from several yards behind. We were able to find the cemetery rather easily, and I hop over the fence first. When we all get over the fence, we notice Steve had not yet arrived, so we all hid in the cemetery. Luckily to our advantage, it was pitch black by the time I turned my flashlight off and we all hid in complete silence. My heart dropped when all I heard was the metallic shaking as if someone was climbing over the fence. The guy had tracked us down, probably due to the fact that Steve yelled cemetery. We all stayed still as we heard the ground crunch and as the guy took slow steps. When in fight or flight moments, you're capable of a lot more than you would think and your brain is put on some super high alert mode or something. As the guy approached, I realized I had my small Swiss Army pocket knife in my pocket. As the guy's steps grew closer to me, when he was right about on top of me, I grabbed the knife and lodged it into the back of his knee. The guy tumbled to the ground with a shriek of pain and a metallic sound as he dropped his weapon. Soon, the pair of headlights came around the corner. Steven made it. We all got up and ran towards the car. While I got up, the light gave me a glimpse of the guy. He was tall, bulky, and had the look of pure hatred in his eye as he clutched the back of his knee. And by his side, a huge machete. I was the last one to get in the car. And even before I fully closed the door, Steve floated out of there. The girls were bawling their eyes out. We drove until the first house, where we politely knocked and asked for directions to a motel or something. It was a friendly old couple. They told us there was not one for miles. They took us in and gave us warm food and a place to rest for the remainder of the night. In the morning, the man brought us hunting rifle with us to retrieve our stuff from our campsite. When we got there, there was nothing stolen, but all our tents were slashed up. The elderly woman called and made a report while we were gone. And when we got back, the officers were at their home and we gave our statements. The officer said there's not enough evidence to find the guy, but they promised to search. We headed home later that day. No one said a word on the way home. We were all processing what really happened. The police unfortunately never found the guy. And yeah, college did split us up a bit. We barely talk about it as a group, and it's been a year. My advice to all of you is please find a populated place to camp. I don't care if it's some Yogi Bear camp. Be in reach of help and police. Stay safe, guys. Please.
Growing up, every summer in July slash August, my family would get together and camp out for two weeks at White Lake State Park in Tamworth, New Hampshire. Some of my best childhood memories were made there. Rollerblading, Nerf gun wars, flashlight tag and water balloon fights with my cousins and neighboring kids in the campground. When I was around my late teen years, my family stopped gathering together to camp out after my grandmother passed away. One of the last years I was there, this one particular memory has stuck with me. A little over 10 years ago, I was 16 years old. It was around 10 p.m. at night when I noticed I had missed a call on my cheapy little track phone. My family was sitting around the campfire cooking s'mores and sharing some laughs, so I decided to go off for some privacy and return the call. I took a long, narrow trail that winds in between other campsites that, at the end, leads up to a bathroom. I wasn't going up to the bathroom. I just wanted to find an empty campsite and set at a picnic table to make my call. There were plenty of those since this whole side of the campground where I was heading was vacant. There were no other campers nearby in that area. It was quiet and dark. So I chose a campsite, sat down at the table. The lights from the distant bathroom from up on top of the hill behind me were illuminating my surroundings just a little bit. I called my friend and was carrying on a conversation for around 20 minutes. As I'm sitting there staring straight ahead, I see a silhouette coming down the road in front of me. The figure is coming towards my direction, where all these empty campsites are. I could see it was a person. It's not that unusual to see people strolling through the campground for a night walk. The people I see usually have flashlights, though. This person did not. I wasn't creeped out at this point. No reason to be. I was just watching curiously. As the person got closer, I could see a better outline, and that was a man I was looking at. I also noticed his pace slowed down. I kept my eyes fixated on him as I continued conversing on my cell phone. A minute or two passes, and now he stopped moving. He's just standing there in the road, looking straight into the campsite where I'm at. I don't know if he knew I could see him. He was staring at me, and I was staring right back at him. He was a little heavy set and tall. I could also make out that he was wearing a light jacket. I couldn't see much for facial features, but I would guess I was staring at a man in his 30s or 40s. Alarm bells were going off in my head now. My mind had turned to mush at this point. I'm frozen. I was no longer listening to what my friend was saying on the phone. I was in a stare off with this guy. Then he started to move again. He was tiptoeing towards me, very carefully, like he didn't want to make a noise. He put one foot in front of the other, leaned forward in a slight hunched form. It looked like he was about to charge towards me. In that moment, I snapped out of that mind mushy frozen state and leaped off the picnic table and started running through the campsite back towards the trail. Thud. 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 I could hear him trampling behind me. Leaves scuffling. Heavy, yet fast footsteps. Footsteps were getting louder and closer. I made it back to that narrow trail. Once he got close to where I was, I heard the sound of twigs snapping and an oof noise that came from the man which I can imagine maybe he tripped or almost tripped and maybe got a face slapped by a tree branch. Most likely, he wasn't familiar with the trail like I was. Whatever the reason was, it caused him to stop chasing after me. I didn't stop to look back. I just kept running, running and running until I made it back to my family's campsite. When I got back, they were still sharing laughs and smiles by the campfire. I broke down crying and I was trembling. I explained what had just happened. My aunt spoke up and said, Oh, jeez. He probably thought he knew you and was coming up to give you a good scare as a joke. She dismissed me. My cousin chimed in and said, Yeah, he probably stopped running after he realized that he didn't actually know you. He probably just feels dumb now. They all chuckle about it and change the subject. I think I was dismissed because no one wanted the good vibes of the night to be ruined, and the fact that I'm just a socially anxious person in general. I'm very cautious and shy. For that time being, I let them convince me that I was just overreacting and overthinking. But here I am years later, looking back and shaking my head over this. I wish I was taken seriously. But other than that one thing happening, it was still a great trip. It was time well spent with family. 
My experience makes me think twice about going for a walk by myself anywhere. I carry pepper spray and a mini keychain alarm on me now. So Mr. Campground Chaser, let's not meet again. Also to add, my speculation was the man may have not been a camper there. It would be easy for anyone to sneak in the campground from the boat launch area. One night, I guess I was about 15, so three years ago, me and a few friends decided to go camping out in the woods. It was a pretty hot summer, and we were like 10, we were all scouts together, and decided that it would be pretty funny to do the whole camping thing again. So we packed some stuff and went to a nearby refuge hut that we have a lot of here in our woods. Now I have to explain that we all live in a village that can only be described as little or even rural, although it's only like 10 minutes to the big city. Yet, there are great woods that separate us from civilization, as the youngsters here always like to put it. So in that city, close to us, there's really huge prisons where they keep all the really bad criminals. You know, the ones who have committed murder or have committed the R word to someone and stuff like that. Recently, there had been an outbreak, and three of the five prisoners had already been caught again. So naturally, my mom didn't want us to go, and was all worried that the other prisoners were still hiding somewhere in the woods. But we were in our youthful foolishness, couldn't care less because all we wanted was a great night where we could drink and do all the other stuff that you do at that age, although you actually aren't allowed to. So we went up there and had fun. And everything was just fine, and about 1 a.m. we decided to finally call it a night and go to sleep. At about 3 a.m. we were awoken by the sound of a vehicle. It was very close to us. And suddenly, we were all for once jerked out of our doze by two car headlights that were shining straight at us. Needless to say that we almost wet our pants. But then it came even worse when suddenly, the lights went out and we heard the car door being slammed shut. It was completely dark and we didn't dare breathe because we had no idea who this was and what he or she was about to do if we did. We then lay there motionless for what seemed like an hour, but I guess it really couldn't have been more than five minutes until we heard footsteps and then the door slammed again and the car drove off. I know it's nothing supernatural and it probably doesn't sound that creepy now, but for me... Those were the scariest minutes I've ever lived through in my entire life. Not knowing who was staring at us there in the middle of the night, but dreading that it might be one of the criminals who are currently on the run. I haven't been camping out somewhere but my garden ever since. This happened to me last year on my birthday. I had a few friends around to sleep in my six-man tent. Whilst I was setting up my tent, my dad came into the garden and told me and my friends to be careful, as he had seen a shady-looking man in a baseball cap slowly walking up and down my street like he was checking out my house. It was about 1 a.m. when me and my friends were sitting on the patio at the table just talking about random stuff when I heard rustling in my neighbor's garden. I didn't find this too unusual because it was the summer, and I lived in a rural area of the UK, and we had hedgehogs living nearby. Then, I noticed the shape of someone's body emerging from the bush. It was a man in a baseball cap. One of my friends asked what he was doing here, but there was no answer. We asked again, and he chuckled and left through my neighbor's gate. It was later on, about 4 a.m., and most of my friends were asleep except for me and my slightly older friend who was in the same year as me. We were whispering to each other as we were trying not to wake everyone else up. I heard my neighbor's fence rattle as if someone had hopped over it. A few seconds later, we see a figure move past the window of a tent. I could barely make it out, but I distinctly remember seeing a hat in the moonlit window. He moved around to the back of the tent 
so I decided to wake everyone up and run back inside my house and into the living room. A good half an hour passed when I heard police sirens outside. This wasn't possible, as my mom was asleep and my dad worked nights. I looked outside to see three police officers in my garden where the tents were, and my neighbor talking to another officer. After a few minutes of watching through my back door window, the police walked out of my garden with a man in his early 40s in handcuffs. I saw my neighbor, and he gestured for me to come outside. My friends followed behind and we spoke to him. No, that my neighbor is in his late 80s and lives alone. He said that he was getting a glass of water from his kitchen when he saw his security light turn on in his garden. He quickly glanced over and saw a man hop over his fence and into my garden. He then called the police, and they said they would come over. After telling me this, a police officer walked over and informed me that the man they arrested was a burglar who had broken into multiple houses in the local area. What he said next still makes me shiver. They said they found him crouched down in the corner of the tent with a large knife. He then advised me and my friends to get our stuff and sleep in the living room. By this time, my mom had been woken up by all the commotion, and she had been given the same information. She called my dad and told him what happened. I don't think I will ever sleep in a tent again. This past weekend, me and my partner decided to go to our usual camping spot. It's very low key. There's never usually anyone up this mountain besides one or two people at a time. And even at that, they're miles away from your campground. It's not a well-known spot. This past weekend, just like every year, we brought my parents' little elderly dog, set up camp, ate some food and drank some beer around the campsite. When we arrived prior to this, we scoped out the area to see how busy it was. There was absolutely nobody in sight. The entire mountain campgrounds were entirely empty. We're used to having one hunter or fisher in the area at least. We've never not seen at least one person the entire trip. So we sat around the fire, completely relaxed with my little dog nearby. When we decide to get into bed, my usually very complacent placid pup refuses to settle inside the tent. It's pretty hot this time of year, so we had the tent unzipped with just the mesh covering the opening to let some breeze in. But my pup was looking through the mesh and sniffing, zoning in on something entirely. We decided to get up and check out the camp for whatever he's looking at. We don't see anything, so we decided to just sit by the fire to fire us out when my sleepy puppy unsettles suddenly with his hackles straight up on end, growling in a deep growl into one direction of the woods. We decided to grab the hunting knife and axe and listen. He's snarling and barking vigorously, which took us by surprise because he's been completely comfortable every other year. After a few hours of him acting on high alert, we decide to flip the truck lights on to illuminate our camp as we're surrounded by darkness. We were listening intently, trying to figure out what he was seeing or hearing. After a few minutes, he lays down and alarms us again a few minutes later, startling us to the point where we make a run for the truck by how aggressively my dog is warning something. We wait, hearts pounding inside of the truck, trying to see what's out there. After about 30 minutes, we assume whatever it is has passed on. After we reposition ourselves in front of the fire again, my dog's hackles are up and we hear the loudest tree branch snap a mere 10 feet away from us in the pitch black wilderness. Again, we hop in the truck with the dog and decide we better leave. As earlier that night, we were hearing wolves hunting for a few hours and their howls echoing through the woods. Our main concern was it being a cougar as they're commonly seen in this area and there had been a lot of attacks on unsuspecting victims. Our main thought was something was stalking us for a long time without moving on. We told my partner's parents that we decided it's better to be safe than sorry, and we were mocked extensively, but we were armed with very minimal weapons, not anything that would handle a mountain lion or a pack of wolves. We were called chickens the entire weekend, 
and mocked over it. I also felt protective over my dog, as she's very small. When I was 12 years old, I went to a week-long scout camp with my troop. Our campsite was notably isolated from the majority of other sites. So even though there were hundreds of kids at the camp overall, there were probably five of us kids and two or three leaders on our site. I shared a tent with two other kids. Being the anti-scout that I was, I brought a full-size cot to sleep on, while the other kids slept on the ground. I'm a horrible sleeper in any conditions other than my own bed, so I've always taken sleeping pills when I go camping. I sometimes have strange reactions to them, where I don't sleep well and get dreams confused with reality. On our final night at camp, it was storming with lightning everywhere. We were in a creeped out mood, telling scary stories before trying to go to sleep. I couldn't wait to go home the next morning. I took my pills and somehow managed to fall asleep. I woke up a few hours into the night. I opened my eyes and in the darkness I could barely make out the crouched over figure of a tall man. I'd woken up because he was gently grabbing my leg. He didn't look like any of my leaders from what I could tell. Confused, groggy, and horrified, I said, What? The figure remained silent. After a week on these sleeping pills, I knew how they could make me confused. I closed my eyes, hoping that it was just the pills combining with the night of scary stories. I felt the gentle grip on my leg again. The figure was still standing there. What? I said again, this time a little more panicked. Suddenly, without a word, the man leaned down on the ground next to me, where I couldn't see because I was elevated. I couldn't hear anything strange happening, but I was filled with so much terror that I couldn't bring myself to peek over the edge of my cot. I was still unbelievably tired and confused and in my frightened stupor, I convinced myself that the sleeping pills were causing me to blend nightmares with reality. I drifted in and out of a horrified semi-sleep for the rest of the night, wondering what had happened. I never recalled hearing anything notable or seeing the man leave the tent. Once the sun began to dimly light the tent, I mustered the courage to look over the edge of the cot. The kid next to me was fast asleep and appeared to be unharmed. If this were all there was to the story, I would dismiss it as a weird reaction to my sleeping pills. But then, the next morning over breakfast, the kid who has been next to me asks me and our other tentmate if somebody had come into our tent overnight. The other tentmate said he'd assumed one of us was getting up to pee and had gone back to sleep. When we all confirmed that none of us had gotten up in the middle of the night, he started freaking out begging our leaders and other scouts from them to admit that they had played a joke on us or that they had a history of sleepwalking. Nobody ever had any idea what we were talking about. I don't know what someone's motives would have happened been to come into our tent only to gently touch my leg and be silent. Unless I have some serious mental blocks, there was no kind of sexual violation that I can recall at least. Just a strange, quiet intruder. I was out camping with my mom and, at the time, six-year-old brother when a white pickup truck pulls into our campsite. Three or four guys get out of the truck all wearing small, bright white lights attached to their hats that blind us from seeing their faces much. They approach my mom and start asking her questions about who we are and what our plans are for the night. My little brother started whimpering and stopped eating the Doritos he had been happily munching on, and I got the impression that my mom was creeped out as well. So the men leave after about five minutes and told my mom that they were official campground employees who were just making sure that everything was all right. Their trucks certainly didn't look official, and they weren't wearing anything that would suggest they were more than just regular, albeit creepy dudes, wandering around and being nosy. 
My mom told my brother and I to get in the car and take only a few essentials like clothes and a bit of food. And we went to my grandmother's house and spent the night there instead. We left the tent at the campsite, giving the illusion that we were still there. The next morning after we had told my grandma about what happened and that we were suspicious, we went back to the campsite to gather our things and head home. When we pulled up, we immediately noticed that our stuff had been picked through by someone who wasn't us. There were footprints leading up to our tent, and the zipper was stuck, halfway open like someone was trying to close it. It was closed when we left it. Our sleeping bags also had boot prints on them. We never saw those guys again, but we still wonder what would have happened if we had stayed. When I was around nine, I went to a summer camp at a nearby YMCA for a few summers. It was a day camp, and there were different camps you could do, such as water sports, craft, canoeing, etc. Each camp lasted a week. I started the summer by taking one of the craft camps, a special one that lasted two weeks. I was really excited about it, but I was nervous because I didn't know anyone else in my group and I'm very shy. The first day, I managed to make friends with an older kid who was in a wheelchair. He was 17, I believe. I'm not sure what his disability was, but he was socially awkward and kind of gave off a creepy vibe. I was trying to be nice to him because no one else talked to him, but he started to make me uncomfortable. First, he'd start by talking about how much he hated being in the wheelchair because it made his back hurt. He liked being able to get out at the end of the day and stretch as well as do some exercises with his physical therapist. I'd just smile and nod as he talked about this, not knowing what else to say. At some point, I mentioned to him how I was a dancer and really liked acrobatics class. He asked me to show him some of my moves, so I did a cartwheel. He told me that my legs looked beautiful when I stretched them out like that. Being a kid, I didn't think much of the comment but I started getting uncomfortable when he began telling me how much he liked my hair or how white my teeth were or how cute I was because I was so little. One day, he was talking about stretching out outside of his wheelchair and mentioned how good it would feel if someone were to walk on his back. You'd be perfect. Just the right size. Would you do that for me one day? I'd love to have you on top of me. He smiled creepily when he said this. So I awkwardly changed the direction of the conversation by telling him how I used to do that for my dad. I was young and stupid. I probably shouldn't have told him that. He got really excited and started talking about how much he'd love it and how good it must have felt for my dad. I bet he loves having his little girl on top of him like that. He reached out to me at this point and put his hand on my knee. We were sitting by a table in the craft cabin. I awkwardly shrugged it off, moving away a little. He smiled and started talking about how good it would feel if I were to do cartwheels on his back and jump on him, maybe even lay down on top of him and rub his sides. I got really uncomfortable at this point, and luckily my mom drove up a moment later, so I was able to leave. This was on the weekend, and the camp was going to continue the following Monday. I didn't mention anything to my mom because I figured he was just lonely and awkward and didn't mean to be creepy. When I got to the camp Monday, he immediately came up to me. I was so upset that I couldn't see you this weekend. I missed my little girl. I smiled and awkwardly walked away, but he followed me. We were all going as a group to the craft cabin. He came up next to me and asked if I wanted to sit on his lap and ride to the cabin with him. I politely declined and managed to avoid him for the rest of the day until I was walking to my mom's car at the end of the day. He came up to me grabbed my hand and pulled me towards him. You've really hurt me today. How would you like it if I hurt you? I yanked my hand away and walked quickly to the car. I told my mom about it all as soon as I got in the car. She immediately drove over to the camp office and spoke with the camp leader about it, who I shared my story with. He assured us he would take care of it immediately. As we were driving away after the meeting, I saw two counselors go up to the boy and lead him into the camp office. 
The look on his face looked like he was going to murder someone. I never saw him after that. I was told that he was kicked out of the camp and never allowed to return. And for the rest of the week, the camp counselors would check on me and make sure that I was okay. So, creepy boy from summer camp, I hope you got your issues worked out and that you're living a happy life now. But please, let's not meet again. I've posted a few times and finally have decided to post this story from a while back. My dad is a journalist and nonfiction writer, but at the time was a reporter for the Genian Pilot, based out of Virginia. He was working on a new book titled The Big Roads When This Occurred. We often went on road trips for his research needs, and once his proposal for his new book was accepted, he went on a cross-country road trip from Virginia to California and back on Old Route 66 for the book. Me being 13 at the time, I demanded he let me bring a friend along so that we were three. The first quarter of our month-long venture went off without a hitch. We either stayed in motels with the occasional stay at a grand old historic hotel. My dad, being the outdoorsman that he is, decided that we should camp about five or six times throughout the trip. The first night we camped, we were in the middle of literal nowhere. No one for at least 20 miles on either side in the middle of the Utah desert. When we arrived at our campsite in our rented minivan, my dad wanted to explore a bit because at the bottom of the hill that our campsite was situated on was an old Pony Express shop. My friend decided to stay in the minivan until my dad and I finished checking out the Pony Express stop to set up camp on account of all the wasps and bees. We were utterly alone and as a rather jumpy and skittish 13-year-old girl, it became apparent we were isolated to the point that, if anything happened, we would be screwed. That's all I could think about, as my dad and I walked down the hill to explore. We checked out the old station, and everything was going smoothly, until we were about halfway back up the hill. A large truck that we noticed driving down the old dirt road a few minutes before had turned into our campsite. We were surprised, but didn't really think anything of it. Maybe this guy was on an adventure too. The truck parked halfway up the road and a man got out. He had what I think was a hunting rifle and started hunting around the area my dad and I were in, about 50 feet from our campsite. Of course, this was an absolute no hunting zone and my dad became a bit concerned because my friend was closer to the stranger than she was to us. He yelled out to the man, saying that there were children around and he couldn't hunt there. As soon as the man turned to face us, I got an overwhelming sense of complete doom. I felt in my entire body that something was not right. The man looked us over, and without saying a word, aimed his gun at us. My dad does not carry a gun, or knife, or any kind of weapon. I felt trapped. My dad ushered me behind a large boulder, but he didn't hide. He stood his ground. There was a solid minute of this man aiming his gun at my dad, and my dad standing completely still, staring back. In my mind, I considered all of the ways this could go down. I was absolutely terrified this guy would shoot my dad, and somehow my friend and I would have to escape or get murdered during this tense minute. The guy lowered his gun, cocked his head to the side, and pointed at my dad using the fake gun fingers and shot him. He got in his truck and drove away. That night, my friend and I slept in the minivan in 90 degree heat because I was positive this guy would come back and murder us all. He didn't come back. A few other creepy incidents occurred on that trip, but we were fine and safe after all. When I was younger, I lived on an estate of houses that backed onto a huge field where many people walked their dogs. It was even used as a cut through to the next neighborhood, which would take approximately 25 minutes to walk though. When I was about 13, my neighbor and I decided to camp out for the night in my back garden, which apart from a six foot wooden fence was completely open to the field, albeit with 20 trees around the fence. 
Seeing as we were into action figures at the time, we decided we would make the tent a hideout. So we got together some branches and one of those army nets to put over the tent to make it a bit stealthier. We also put the tent in the corner of the back garden which had a small roof over it, which made it very dark once the sun went down. We did the usual thing, ate loads of chips and sweets before we decided to try and get some sleep in our well-hidden super dark tent. Around 4 a.m., I woke up to the sound of someone landing and then walking on small stones. I then realized that below the fence my mom and dad had decorated with some gravel and flower pots. At first I thought it was our cat, but it was far too loud to be such a small animal. I slowly sat up, trying not to make too much noise from my sleeping bag. Then I heard it again. Once again I tried to make my way out to the front of the tent silently and look through the zipper. About ten feet away from us, there were two guys dressed in all black, crouching under the windowsill of the kitchen talking to each other. I immediately froze and had no idea what to do. They proceeded to creep closer to us, looking for more windows or maybe an entrance, because we were in the corner of the garden. We were quite close to the path that led to the side of our house, where there was a door into the adjoined garage. I heard them talking quite clearly, as now they were less than five feet away from me and my friend who was still asleep. They were talking about being unseen and just taking whatever they could find in the garage instead of breaking into the house and disturbing anyone. I had no idea what to do, so I rang the house phone, which was pretty loud, and waited for someone to answer. It took a while as it was very early. As soon as the phone rang, the two people bolted to the fence and hopped over. My dad then answered and I whispered for him to get outside ASAP with the bat or something. Nothing happened in the end, but I'm glad that my friend slept silently. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Good night, everybody, and have an excellent rest. And I will read to you in the next video.